The Real and the Authentic. Post-production sound designed for documentary in the digital era. The question surrounding the employment of non-originated material in post-production sound design for documentary is focused upon the concept of authenticity. The definition of what is authentic and what is artifice is problematic within documentary practice. Complete authenticity in broadcast media is a chimera. It simply does not exist. The process of program making automatically precludes this. We, as receivers, will not ask if a documentary is authentic, but if it is genuine or true. We do not expect that all information available on a specific subject matter is included, but that the program maker has identified and rationalized this information and presented the most important and cogent aspects. It is this contract of trust that exists between the program maker and the receiver. We trust that the editorial process is objective and considered, and that important elements in the form of evidence or testimony have not been discarded in order to promote a personal agenda. This is not to say we therefore slavishly accept the delivered programme as unvarnished fact. Programme makers are motivated by a personal belief structure, be it moral, political, religious or secular, and we both accept and embrace this. It is understood that, at a fundamental level, Documentary is the dissemination of factual information in the form of originated and archived material and human testimony that bears witness to an event, a sequence of events, an idea or a quest. What we do expect is that opinion is not delivered as fact and that conjecture is adequately labelled as such. Therefore, if we accept that documentary, in effect, is part of a larger debate, we expect the embedded bias or opinion to be constructed through the employment of factual evidence. When we question the authenticity of a delivered broadcast text, this is what we mean. Natural versus design sound. The fundamental difference between natural and design sound is inexorably linked to the diegetic frame. The sound designer must tread the boundaries between actuality and what is perceived as actuality by the receiver. This is where natural sound can often be found wanting. We are presented with an image and we immediately bring in preconceptions about the sound we expect to accompany this image. Often those preconceptions will conflict with the actuality. Therefore, the sound designer, in consultation with the production team, must choose whether to support or defy those expectations. It is an important decision that is always wrapped around a single issue appropriateness. Does the natural sound, captured at point of source, support the edited diegetic narrative? Is the recorded actuality part of the story? Often this is indeed the case, particularly when one is dealing with the documentation of a major conflict. For example, it would be inappropriate to include a post-production sound design for a documentary dealing with the invasion of Ukraine. If the explosions and the gunfire don't conform to our preconceived expectations of how they should sound, then it becomes a function of the programme to educate and enlighten the receiver. The natural sound provides a significant proportion of the emotive core of the visual narrative, and to remove and replace it with heightened Hollywood bangs and crashes would be entirely inappropriate. Nevertheless, a substantial proportion of actuality recorded at point of source of the diegetic frame is not necessarily significant to the final constructed narrative. Indeed, these sounds often conflict with the narrative because they defy perceived expectations. When their presence is not required to support a narrative, and the origin of the sound is not important, then it would be appropriate to remove and replace it with a post-design which not only conforms to our expectations, but also supports the visual and didactic narrative through emotive reinforcement and fluid continuity. As a sound designer, it is necessary to make the distinction between sounds that define a certain location and those which just happen to be present. Recorded actuality does not always provide a succinct representation of location. As a working practitioner, I have long been aware that there has been no true categorization of the individual structural components that make up a distilled evocation of location. 
Of course, we could decide if a sound is diegetic or non-diegetic, whether a particular sound is referenced within the visual frame. But what of the environment in its entirety? Let us invent a dramatic construct. The scene is set on a deserted rural beach some 30 miles from the nearest significant urban settlement, although there is a small village on the headland about half a mile away beyond the fields of gorse and heather. Two young lovers lie on the sand and look up at the stars. It is 2.55am on a warm August night. We know at 3am one of the lovers must leave, never to return. They do not speak. If we close our eyes and imagine ourselves in that place and at that time, what would we expect to hear? I am willing to wager that your list would be as similar, if not identical to mine. Gentle sea wash. Night birds. Insect sounds. Perhaps a distant dog barking. These are the keynote identifiers of that location within that context. They are the location-defining sounds simply because collectively these are the sounds we expect to be present. Any environment will contain keynotes that define the location. The sounds listed above are also archetypal sounds. An archetypal sound is one that predates human existence. These sounds are very important to the sound design palette because they invariably elicit an emotional response from the receiver. The emotive potency of the sound archetype has long been understood in dramatic fiction. The thunderstorm sequence surrounding the birth of the Frankenstein monster. We, as receivers, are made emotionally receptive to the visual narrative because beneath our veneer of rationality and civilization, our primitive selves know that the thunder gods are angry. They are angry because Dr. Frankenstein has taken their power and trapped it within man-made machines where it buzzes and arcs, an immortal predator confined within an imperfect prison, spitting and cursing and promising terrible consequences. Even before the monster awakes, we know nothing good will come of this. That is the power of the archetype. <laughs> The final sound category is the signal sound. This sound type is perhaps the least relevant when discussing implicit sound design in documentary because it is a term to describe narrative sound effects, sounds that are required in order for the narrative to progress. In theatre we would call these sounds spot effects and they can usually be found in the stage directions of the written text. However, it is possible for a signal sound to also be a keynote sound. If we return to our scheduled beach and add the sound effect of a distant church bell striking three.
The church bell is a keynote because it is appropriate to the location, based on our understanding that there is a small village on the headland. It is a signal sound because one of the lovers must leave at 3am. If the bell does not strike, the lover will not leave, and the narrative breaks down. If we return to Dr Frankenstein's laboratory, there is a sound effect that embodies all three sound categories. The lightning effect that strikes the conductor. This is a keynote signifier, for it is one of the defining sounds of a thunderstorm. It is an archetypal sound, because it predates human existence, and it is a signal sound, for if it fails to strike the conductor, then the laboratory machines will not power up. The monster will therefore not be brought to life, and the narrative would fail to progress. The creative sound designer needs to have an understanding of this process of distillation, regardless of what genre they are working in. Of course, how that understanding is manifest is based significantly upon the requirements of genre. Once more, we return to the notion of appropriateness. OK, perhaps it's time now for a case study. In 2002, Fremantle Media produced a 13-part documentary series entitled History of Football, The Beautiful Game. Much of the footage used over the 13 episodes was archive material, which was almost invariably mute. As the composer and sound designer for this project, I was required to signify most of this material. I was expecting this, it was part of the brief. What I was not expecting was the need to signify contemporary shot footage. So, the example I have chosen is the opening sequence to the episode entitled Football Cultures. The original sound contained within each shot was unusable because it did not relate to the image presented within the frame. This was because the production team usually did not bother recording atmospheric wild track sound except through the onboard camera mic. Their brief was to conduct interviews with relevant individuals, which they did very well. However, when it came to recording material in exterior locations, the quality of sound declined distinctly. Some close-up and medium shot audio was usable, but the wide shots, though often visually arresting, contained no usable sound whatsoever. The question then arises, could or should we include that sound within the edited visual narrative, or does there remain an argument for stripping this sound and creating a designed oral artifice? I've already talked about this in the lecture, so let's move on to the actual shots. The first eight shots in the opening of football cultures, which I call the Ghana sequence. Shot one, the colonial fort. Originated sound, middle distant European human sounds, laughter, chatter, children shouting, children running, children expressing discontent, adults chastening children, general tourist commerce. Traffic, distant with some car horns, birdsong, percussive wind sounds on microphone, palm trees moving in the wind, unidentifiable noise. Design sound, a light sea breeze moves through the branches of the palm trees. Birds fly across the frame. The position of the cannon suggests a seashore or harbour close by. A subtropical climate points to insect sounds, shikadas, mosquitoes and flies, although the sea breeze would reduce the presence of flying insects that one might find in a greater concentration in inland areas. So, the keynote identifiers, breeze, birdsong, insects, distant sea wash. Shot two, the colonial fort reverse angle, originated sound, quite similar in content to shot one, tourist voices. There were differences in level, the microphone was pointing closer to civilization, and those sounds were raised somewhat. The percussive wind sounds were reduced from shot one. I believe I could now discern sea wash, possibly because the wind percussion didn't obscure it as it had in the previous shot. However, that could have been my imagination. Shot two, design sound. The presence of the sea is confirmed, but should be distant, barely discernible. Another bird flies through the frame. The location of the fort in relation to the sea confirms the appropriateness of shikadas. Because this is a reverse angle of the previous shot, 
the design sound remains the same, except for a slight lift in level for the sea wash. So, keynote identifiers, breeze, birdsong, insects, distant sea wash. Shot three, kids playing on the beach. Originated sound. The camera was close to a main road, so the dominant sound is heavy, mainly commercial traffic. Significantly, you could not hear the children on the beach because the camera mic was positioned much closer to the road. You can tell by the optical quality of the image that the camera was positioned some distance away and had zoomed in on the kids playing beach football. Shot 3. Design sound. This shot provided my one opportunity to include a diegetic synchronised effect, the wave breaking on the rocks. This would lock in all the other design elements contained within the sequence, consolidating the presentation, or rather, the illusion of authenticity. So, the keynote signifiers. Children playing, distant. Sea wash. Some insects. Wave breaking on the rocky shoreline. Shot 4. The fishing boat. Originated sound. Identical to shot 3, because the camera was in the same position, and therefore, the camera microphone was capturing the same heavy traffic. Shot 4. Design sound. The design sound should have been identical to shot 3, but we had already moved on in the visual narrative. I didn't add sounds, but reduced the level of the children playing. I boosted the sea sounds and wave sounds and reduced the level of shikadas and the wind. This shot is about purposeful movement, and the waves and sea sounds supported that sufficiently. I decided against the inclusion of any boat sounds because of the optical quality of the shot signposted it as a long lens zoom. Intellectually, I shouldn't have changed the sounds at all, but design isn't about provoking an intellectual understanding in the receiver. It is about supporting and indeed manufacturing an unquestioned emotive truth. The sound design for a sequence of this type should go intellectually unnoticed by the receiver. And if a designer doesn't achieve this, then the design is fundamentally flawed. Ghana sequence, shots five, six, seven and eight. Originated sound. This was simply a miasmic cacophony of non-specific noise. Metaphorically, if you were to take every tube of oil paint pigment and then mix them all together on a canvas, the result you'd get is a murky dull brown green. This is what the originated sound for shots 5 through to 8 sounded like. Design sound. These shots were problematic because there was a great deal of visual information to support. I decided to specify the dominant keynote, that of human interaction, in some depth. Therefore, I kept only the sea sound a very low level. Birdsong, which manifested itself within the higher frequency tonal range and therefore could avoid being dragged into the mid-frequency range of human voices. And just a hint of shikadas for texture. I constructed a human pad from a variety of crowd sources and treated this with equalisation to remove the higher frequencies. In order to glue these sounds together, I composed a music track and treated it to make it seem as if it were playing on a radio located in one of the dockside shops. Throughout these shots, I varied the levels and moved these sounds to support the vibrancy and vitality of the visual frame. The sound design needed to evoke a sense of exuberance to adequately support the visual narrative. Okay, so let's first play this sequence with the originated sound, that is the camera mic sound that came with the visual sequence.
Okay, so you've seen the originated sound version. You've seen the designed sound version. So maybe we should look at the broadcast version. This is identical to the designed version with the addition of a non-diegetic voiceover or commentary by Terence Stamp. Once known as the Gold Coast, Ghana is the most successful footballing nation within Africa, a nation where politics have helped mould a distinct football culture. It was on these shores that the colonialists first landed, setting up their capital at Cape Coast. Ghana's first club, Excelsior, was born here in 1903. They no longer exist, though the Cape Coast mysterious dwarfs, their modern incarnation, still use the site where Excelsior used to play. I'm going to play now, once again, the design sound for this opening sequence. I've played it already, but I'm going to let it run on to the archive material that follows directly afterwards. Okay, so I've taken this sequence and placed it into Logic Pro, which is the, the software that we use in the department. And I'm going to play it through again. Um, so in orange is the contemporary footage with the post-production sound design. Uh, and then in this kind of purpley blue is the um, sound designer created for the archive footage. And I'll talk about why I had to do this. Um, but first of all, let's run it through again, just to refresh our memories. There we go. I'll position this here so you can actually see the playback of the track itself. Here we go. OK, so I've talked in some detail about the post-production sound design for the contemporary footage, but I want to talk now about 
my approach to the sound design for the archive sequence. Now, in this lecture, I've talked about oops, I've talked about implicit sound design. So let me talk about what I mean by implicit. The idea of an implicit sound design in documentary is a sound design that appears to be natural, that you accept without question. Um, and basically, I've been talking about that for the last half an hour. Um, and the same is true for this sequence here, for the archive footage. Um, the intention was that the sound design should appear to be contemporary to the recording, natural sound. Um, of course, it wasn't. And the reason for this is because this is archive footage that was recovered from an archive, I think, in um, I think it was in Milan. There are these archive sound libraries all over the world, um, uh, picture archives, I should say. Um, and sound is almost invariably absent from archive footage um, of the film era. So stuff shot on film, not shot on video, but shot on film. So from, I don't know, 1901 to 1981, perhaps, or 1971. Well, maybe 1981. I mean, the, the original video cameras were far too bulky uh, to be going on location. Anyway, I digress, as I will sometimes do. Um, so all archive material is mute. Um, this is because it's shot mute. This probably would have been, I don't know when exactly, but it would have been before the advent of the tape recorder. So to try and record sound on location would have, been, would have required either writing it directly to disc, inscribing a wax master and then pressing it in shellac, which is unlikely, um, or through the use of um, sound roll, film cameras that are designed to, sh to record optical sound. Uh, again, this was used predominantly in feature film production, not used in um, newsreel production, and the majority of this footage would have been shot for newsreel, which would have, would have then been part of the cinema program of um, events. You would see some newsreel, you'd see a B movie, and then you'd see the A movie, and stuff like that. You know, you wouldn't just go and see a film in those days, you'd see a whole program um, of films, including a Gaumont newsreel or various newsreels, depending on which country you're in. Um, and so the way these things were shot were they were shot mute, they were then edited uh, and a commentary placed over the top, um, usually in London or New York or wherever, wherever the, the stuff was, was being produced. So very rarely was any location sound shot. The only time that they would try and re record location sound is if they were then doing an interview uh, with uh, somebody on location. Uh, but again, uh, very unlikely. So the problem with history of football, this 13 part documentary, so 13 hours, because each, each episode was an hour long. Um, the problem with this is that I would have said about 60% of all of the footage was this archive material. Um, and my job, I, well, I was employed originally to write the music. Uh, but then I was subsequently asked to do the sound design. Uh, and my job was to signify this stuff with sound. <clears throat> now often, uh, if you watch uh, this kind of material, it's just very generic sound pads placed underneath just so that there is no mute. But I'm a sound designer and I didn't want to do that. So I tried to make it feel as if it was actually contemporary to the source. So let me play it through. I'm just going to play it through the end of the opening sequence through to the um, archive material. So let's have a bit of a run in. So, mute footage with some uh, commentary placed over, usually by somebody who spoke like that. 
that kind of mid 20th century kind of broadcast. I say jolly good. And they'd be recording it into a ribbon mic. And actually I'm using a ribbon mic right now. And let me just move this camera to show you. There it is. This is a Grampian GR2, um, which was made by Grampian um, in the 1960s. This is a 1960s ribbon mic. Ribbon mics are beautiful, lovely, warm microphones. They're very rarely used now. I think they're making a bit of a comeback. Um, yeah, so this Grampian mic was not actually used, intended for high fidelity recording. They were made for PA, PA systems announcements like at railway stations and things like that. Um, they were not designed for sound recording like for music, but the sound quality is just exquisite. So uh, anyway, I digress as I will, as I have already. So let's let's play this little bit again and I'll just go into it in more detail. So the first thing that might have struck you is the fact that the music is the same. I produced one music track and at the point where we cut to the archive material I then add a treatment which I shall talk about in a minute to make it sound contemporary. So let's listen to it again. You'll notice that the music continues. So you hear a lot more in the archive. You hear the, the, the percussive tambourines and things that I was doing. Um, I took a sample of that kind of twiddly, reedy sound from um, a sample CD that I bought called Sounds of Africa, uh, which cost me £120 in 2002. But you're paying for the copyright, so you could actually use it for broadcast material. So I, I took a sample from that and then I added the percussion also, I took the sample of the singing um, and so I combined it into a, a composed piece. Um, though I regard it as sound design rather than composition, it didn't go to my PRS. Um, and so that runs all the way throughout. That gives a kind of continuity because I wanted that kind of continuity because um, as uh, Terence Stamp said in his um, voiceover commentary, little has changed in this country. and the images support that so I wanted to reinforce that semiotically by having the same music running through. See that bit of singing there? All this percussion I did live in front of a microphone. Okay, so it's quite a simple design. There's just general crowd ambience and this music and a few little cheaty synchronized effects. So I'll show you the cheeky synchronized effects. So you had the ooh sounds with the mist. That wasn't so much synchronized. I just hadn't noticed that before. You don't hear the ball. I'll explain that in a, in a, in a while. I, you don't hear the actual event. It's just the atmosphere doesn't change regardless of why of where what we're looking at. The atmosphere is constant. It doesn't cut with image. And I'll explain that in a minute. We have a cheer when they score. And my two little cheeky bits of synchronization are when the player in close-up kicks the ball and then the other player in long shot receives the ball and I sync those two actions up. Here we go. There we have the boof and the boof. Um, that was more to entertain myself than anything else. Hopefully it wasn't really noticed. So essentially the keynote signifiers are general pad sounds crowd responding to the action quite far away, quite low in the mix, uh, whether it's a miss or when it's a goal, you can actually hear the cheers. Now the crowd sounds, um, because this is a FIFA sponsored um, program, I was allowed 
a feed to FIFA broadcasts without commentary. Um, and so all of the crowd sounds in the, throughout the whole <laughs> of this 13 part documentary was actually taken from a match, an old firm match from the early 1990s, um, Celtic and um, Glasgow Rangers, uh, which I then treated. Um, I don't know, do I have, uh, let me have a look in, here we go. This is from my archive, there we go. This is one of the CDs, this is number three. And can you see, I've got Crowd Atmospheres 1929 to 1938, Crowd Atmospheres 1939 to 1978, so these are the film eras, and then 1979 to 2000, the video era Crowd Atmospheres. And I would treat the different crowd atmospheres through the use of EQ um, and distortion to create the sense of being early recordings. Um, so I degraded the quality of the recordings in order to make them seem contemporaneous, contemporaneous to the, the footage. Um, I'm, I'm, I think you're hearing my mouse move a lot and some clumpy stuff because of this microphone. Um, and I actually gave these, these sound effects to the editors because I didn't want to have to do the sound for every single thing because an awful lot of the documentary was then this player gets the ball, runs with the ball, passes the ball, somebody else scores, crowd cheers. So I, did, I devised crowd atmospheres that the, the editors could just put on uh, a sort of pad. Um, and then I had this open-ended sound effect, which ended with cheering crowds, um, and then with a ball kick and the ball going into the goal. Um, and they could just take that sound and place it and sync it to the ball being struck and then top and tailored according to the needs so they would just fit in. So an awful lot of the material um, that was just dull stuff, um, I let the editors, because I was in an office in Stephen Street, uh, the fourth office down, the three other offices were all occupied by an editor and a producer, each working on a program. So I treated all of that stuff. I also got some various crowds here which are contemporaneous that I could use at some point. There we go. And those are all sounds that I took from an old firm match from the 1990s and treated. So the cheering that you can hear uh, at the very end is actually a goal being scored by somebody in this uh, old firm match. There we go. Okay, so it's all about kind of subtleties and semiotics. Let me show you how I treat a sound. So I'm just gonna do, I'm not gonna find a sound. I've got here into my microphone. This is my track here, Reese GR2. That's the, the name of the microphone. So there are some certain effects that I can use. For a start, I can pitch sounds up or down. So I'm gonna switch the pitch shift on. Um, and it's set to time to vocal, so I can do harmonies for myself. Oh, here you go. So, so now, now you, you can, can hear, hear half, half of me speaking, speaking normally, and half, half of me speaking five semitones higher. higher. I, I wish, wish I, I could, could speak, speak a bit faster, faster but, but it's a bit freaky, freaky hearing it on my headphones. headphones. If, if I, I wanted, wanted to sound like Satan, Satan I could take it right down. I am the god of hellfire. <laughs> so we got that. So we can raise stuff, or I did a lot of this kind of warbly, where to make it feel as if it was the tape was warbling in. in so I go whoa, whoa, for the sound effects. Um, I've also got a channel EQ. Let me just open this up. Um, and I've got it set at phone filter notch. So. This is one of the EQ settings that I use to make it sound older. Um, I'll switch it on now and it sounds a little bit like I'm on the telephone. Oh, I pressed the wrong button there. Let's go back. There we are. So I have a very different sound now. I can just narrow it a little bit. There we go. So I'm getting um, a kind of, this is the BBC Home Service kind of sound. 
Also, I can add a bit of overdrive. I've got it set at warm drive. I can switch that on and that adds a little bit of distortion. There we go. A little bit of distortion um, and that makes it sound a little bit older. Um, if I wanted to mess around some more, I could add some reverberation. I've got a really big um, reverberation here set up. Let's set it down to about minus 30 dB. So when I switch that on, it's going to sound like I'm in a grand church like this that really is a long reverb perhaps it's a bit too long let's have a slightly lesser one so I'll just go let's have um, a swimming pool there we are that's a little bit better there we go so I can do all of these different things with EQs. Let's um ooh, ooh, if you ever wondered hang on, hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> if you've ever wondered I'm gonna turn all this shit off, hang on. There we are, back to normal again. If you've ever wondered how all of those harmonies, those real top-notch harmonies are recorded by, you know, your favourite artists, often they will just do an ooh and then put a harmonizer on, a pitch shift, so it sounds ooh with a bit of <laughs> I could, I could, I could, I could just, just be, be making him us if, if I wanted, wanted to be with a hundred percent mix. Sound, sound very Welsh well right now. <laughs> I'm I, think, I, I suspect I might be freaking you out a bit. bit. I'll, I'll switch that off. off. Okay. So there we go. So I used a combination of channel EQ, overdrive, some pitch shift, um, and sometimes a little bit of reverb, not for this sequence, but for other sequences. So let's play a little bit through again. So whilst the opening contemporary sequence is in stereo, this sequence is in mono. You can tell it's in mono. Let me just make this track a bit bigger. There we go. Can you see how the various things, the, the, each leg, this is the left leg, this is the right leg. So it's, it's two legs, it's dual mono, but it's a mono sound. So it just sounds comes from there. Whereas in stereo, sounds can move across the stereo frame, as I did with this opening one. Not too much, just a little bit, just to give it a bit of texture and width because this is telly. Um, if it was a cinema scope, then there'd be really quite wide stereo, well, it'd be surround sound. So this is mono, this is stereo and this is mono. So it cuts from stereo to mono. People sort of notice that, not necessarily consciously, but subconsciously uh, they do. So I, th I was thinking, well, if somebody was recording this, the audio for this event, how would they do it? Imagine they did bring a wax recorder or a um, uh, an audio stock film camera and re was recording what we call ambience. Um, you'll often hear, if you if anybody who listens to Test Match, Test Match Special, um, they will often refer to either the stump mic or the ambient mic. And the ambient mic is just the crowd sounds and it's just to give a sense of being there. What was very noticeable during lockdown and COVID is how much the events, particularly football, but also the cricket, the West Indies um, against England cricket series that was put on here, how much is left, is lost when you don't have the crowd sounds to the point where they put on fake crowd sounds just to make it feel a little bit more important, I suppose. Human sounds. Human sounds are archetypal sounds. And so you have effect spikes. So I was assuming that this perhaps would be an effects mic at this time would be one simple mic 
just plonked somewhere and left. And that's how I designed the sound. That's why the music and the dancing and the singing is constant because it was happening at a point in relation to the static microphone. So the, 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 the microphone does not move with the image. It is just in one place recording the ambience of the whole event. And that's how I approached the design for this, that here's the microphone. So I can do sort of whatever I want, but what I can't do is have the sound of the football. I can't hear the sound of all of these people shaking hands um, and saying hello to this, um, this empire guy. It kind of freaks me out a little bit seeing all of this, but anyway, um, it's our history. So look at his face. Oh God. Um, <laughs> I digress yet again. Um, so I couldn't have done this anyway because I would have needed human sounds. I would have needed to find somebody to dub say, hello, yes, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. So an awful lot of the time when I was doing this kind of post-production sound design for archive footage, I would assume that it is just, I'm, there's, I'm holding the effects mic, obviously, on a place, static, just recording the general atmosphere. I got the hint of that. I got sort of, I got inspired by that by reading um, um, Attenborough's doc, um, biography uh, when he was talking about ZooQuest. Uh, ZooQuest was one of the first nature documentaries series um, in the 1950s hosted by, uh, by Attenborough, uh, David Attenborough. Uh, and the idea was it was a connection with London Zoo. And the idea was that they would go and they would capture animals to bring back to London Zoo. It would never happen now. Uh, and he explained that the only recording that was done in terms of sound was him in the camp where they were based, just recording local sounds on a tape recorder, one of the very early tape recorders that would become commercially available um, in 1949, 1950, that sometime then. They never took the um, they never took the the recorder the tape recorder on location to record the animals when they were shooting the the video or the film of the animals. This is because the camera made a large grinding sound. It wasn't silent, and so all you would have heard would have been the sound of the camera. Also, the tape recorder was very very bulky. It'd be very difficult to move about, um, and all the sounds were put on afterwards. So when they took the footage back um, and edited all the sounds together, all the images together to make the program, there would be a Foley artist um, who would then create the sound of the hippo running into the, the stream and all of the other sound effects were all done in a Foley stage. Um, you could read it in David Attenborough's um, biography, Life on Air, uh, the chapter called, uh, I think it's called Fixing Sound or Something Sound. So I got the idea from there that you're actually recording ambience just to to give a context to the visual sequence because as I will, have, I was, as I'll tell you in the workshops afterwards, images are just patterns of light. They have no weight. You know, if you have a series of images, you may as well be looking at pictures of your nan in Marbella in 1968 for all the, the resonance they will have with you. Here's a question, actually, when we're talking about the importance of sound over image. And I'm, I'm biased, I'm a soundie, I don't give a damn about pictures, if I'm honest. But what would you rather have? Yeah, you've got a choice between two things. Um, your great, great, great grandmother. Yeah, You've got a choice. You can either have a photograph of her and you'll see what she looks like. And it would be one of those kind of very stiff kind of posed shots that the Victorians did. So you could either have that photograph or you could have a recording made on a wax cylinder from, I don't know, um, 1860 with her describing what she had for breakfast, her speaking. What would you rather have? What would be a more immediate to you in terms of recognition? I'm guessing it would be the audio. You'd want to hear her more than you'd want to see her. Um, and that is true in all aspects of media. 
Except perhaps still photographs. Still photographs have an emotive quality that transcends everything. But a sound can transform you, can take you back in time. You know, you can have a, a smells are like that as well. But a certain, you can hear a certain sound and suddenly you're transported or a song and you're transported back to a different time where that song had a resonance for you. Sound is much more emotive. Sound is a lean forward, whereas image is lean back. And so the sound design for the contemporary sequence was let's look at, let's design the sound for what the camera is looking at rather than where the camera physically is. Let me play you that again. Sorry for the clump. So, post-production sound design is for contemporary footage for this context is we're not we're not showing or we're not playing back where the, the microphone is, which is next to the camera. We're actually recreating what the camera is seeing. So the diegetic sound um, is contained within the frame of what we're viewing. Whereas for the archive material, no, let's not have that shot. There we are. For the archive material, I'm designing the sound specifically for where I imagine <laughs> I got the microphone again. The microphone is positioned. And I believe that that added a sense of location and authenticity that hopefully once we have the voiceover of the top and uh, any other little bits and pieces, people would just accept without question as contemporary to uh, the images. Okay. So this is this is online. This lecture obviously is online, but the workshops um, are in the Williams Media Lab, um, and they start. I think the first one on Monday is eleven thirty. So I look forward to seeing you all there, uh, and I can finally say hello to you face to face rather than all this on online stuff that I've been doing all through the year. So. See the first group um, at 11.30. Don't be late. Thanks. Finally, let us return to the clip that had the originated sound, the sound that was captured by the camera when on location. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I faked this. Now, I'm not lying. When I came to do the actual post-production sound design for this sequence, the sound that was contained in the film, the edited sequence, the visual edited sequence with the originated sound was entirely unusable and it had lots of noise, it had people talking, it had traffic, all those kind of things. Um, so I swapped it out with the post-production sound design as I've just described. However, I did not keep the originated sound when I originally did this 20 years ago. I don't have it, so I faked it. Let's play it again. So how did I do it? Well, I made sure that every single different sound clip um, was cut with picture. So the sound and the image were cut together like an assemble edit and that reinforces the notion of edit impact. You feel the change. Um, and to reinforce that, I'd have a very dynamic sound for shot one. 
and much less dynamic uh, sound for the reverse angle shot um, to emphasize the fact or to suggest that that reverse shot was taken some time after the first shot, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour. Uh, and the dynamics of the sound of that environment had changed in that time. This shot here with the kids, let's open it up. There we go. What is patently clear from this shot is that the camera was positioned some way away and zoomed in. You can tell by the optical, optical quality of the shot that um, the, the, the camera had zoomed in to this image and that it was actually quite far away from a higher position. So I thought, well, it's on a higher position because it's on a pathway next to a very busy road. Now, there was lots of unclassifiable noise in this shot, um, but it wasn't a roadway. I completely, completely faked that. I'm particularly proud of the lorry that's just accelerating away when we cut to the marketplace. Let me play you that little bit, because that really then emphasizes, how do I, there we are. Uh, the fact that it is, it is originated sound, even though of course it's not, it is designed sound, um, designed to sound like it's the originated sound from the recording, from the capture. The sewing, incongruous sound, you know, uh, very characteristic of location sound recording. And the fact that time has passed um, between each shot that has been captured. Um, and that reinforces the notion of originated sound. So dynamic changes, um, edit impacts, and also the idea that I spoke earlier of that captured sound, originated sound, captures the sound where the camera is. Whereas design sound recreates the sound of what we're looking at. And that is the fundamental difference. And so if you all watched this and believed without question that that was the originated sound for that sequence, it was a lie. Sound design is all about lying. And if you believed it, then I owned you. I owned you.